We'll uh, we'll give it five or five or ten minutes, guys. We'll wait for a few more people to come in, and then we'll um, we'll start if that's okay. I'll go and get make myself a cup of tea. I'll be back in uh, a couple of minutes, and then we'll uh, we'll crack on. <laughs> Okay, so we've got a few of you in now. We're recording as well. Um, I don't, I'm conscious of the time as well. I don't want to keep people too late by waiting. So what we'll do, we'll start. If people join, uh, just keep admitting them as I go through. Is everybody able to see what I'm seeing at the moment? And can everybody hear me clearly? Just anybody, just say yes to me, and I'll uh, I'll crack on. Yeah, yeah, I can hear you. Thank you. Yeah, perfect. Okay, thank you. So, what we're going to do is, I've I've had a look. Thank you all very much for your feedback from last week. So, basically, what we're going to try and do is make it a little bit more interactive. I have signed up to Kahoot. Um, which we're going to use to go through some of the multiple choice questions in the second half of the presentation. We're going to go through the examination a little bit quicker. I will do it in a similar format to last time round. 
um, using a simulated patient, getting you to think a little bit about some of the signs that you might find in the respiratory exam. Um, we're just going to spend a little bit of time. You guys should all know now how to how to do the exam. So we'll we'll just fly through it, refreshing your memory. Think a little bit about what you might find along the way, and then we'll move on to spending a bit more time on the the multiple choice questions. So objectives for today, like last week, we're going to recap the exam, going to use the knowledge that you have already just to think about what you might find in the OSCE. Um, we're going to go through some multiple choice questions and then you're going to use those to just talk a little bit around some key topics in respiratory medicine. And we're going to hopefully provide a few tips and tricks along the way as well. So with the examination, like we said last time, be structured, be methodical, don't be robotic, react to the person that you see in front of you. Um, so let's go through. Um, as always, we're going to start by washing our hands, cleaning our stethoscope, introducing yourself, getting permission, exposing the patient appropriately and putting them in the correct position. So for the respiratory exam, if you've got a real person in front of you, keep them covered for as long as you can, but say to them, at some point, I'm going to need you to move your top so that I can get a clear view of the chest. Sit them at 45 degrees. That's the position that you want them in for the respiratory exam and then move on to examining. So have a proper look around, as we've said. So for today, this is our simulated patient. We've got a slightly older woman. So when you're seeing that kind of patient in the respiratory exam, it's going to have a lot more things in play. So thinking about age demographics, you know, for any condition that you're going to be examining in an OSCE, it's got to be something chronic because it needs to be, you know, we need to plan that somebody's going to come in and give up their time in order to be examined. And it's got to be stable because they have to be well. You can't have you can't be examining somebody who's very sick in an OSCE. It has to be somebody who's got a stable chronic condition. So in respiratory, that's going to immediately narrow it down to a few things. And if you see somebody older, you've got a few more of those in play. You wouldn't typically expect a young person to have a diagnosis of COPD, except in a few key cases. So like alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency can lead to early onset of COPD. But those cases are going to be really rare. So if you see somebody older, COPD could be on your mind. Somebody that has had lung cancer could be in play. Uh, pulmonary fibrosis is a chronic stable condition. So these are all things that might come into your mind. And then asthma is also one as well. And those are the kind of things you, it's going to be common things, stable things, chronic things. You can immediately rule out in an OSCE reasonably. They're not going to give you somebody with a pneumonia. They're not going to give somebody that is, you know, having an asthma attack in front of you because it's acute and they're not going to be well. So think about those kind of things when you're seeing this person in front of you. This is our simulated patient, as we've said. So what you're going to be doing is looking for things like this. So you can see here, if you take a look at those fingertips, you can see that they're clubbed and you know how to check for those. You're going to be looking, guiding the patient's hands up because they find it really difficult to follow this movement so that you can see that window. But get down to the level, have a look, bring their hands together, because if you say to them, put your fingertips together, a lot of people have difficulty. So to speed it up, just to say to them, I'm just going to take your hands and guide them up. Have a look for that window in, in clubbing. It's going to be obliterated. There are loads of different causes of clubbing and we're going to come on to more of them a little bit later on. But what we've got so far from our examination is a slightly older patient who's got some evidence of clubbed fingers. So as we're moving our way up the arm, measure the pulse and say, I'm just going to ask you just to just to sit still for a moment whilst I feel your pulse have a look at their chest as well to measure the rest rate. Don't tell them that you're looking at their breathing because as soon as you tell somebody that, they automatically start breathing differently to how they would normally. You need to be able to count it out. So do, do 30 seconds, use 15 of them to count the pulse and use 15 to count the rest break. JVP, we talked about it last week. How do you look for it? Where is it found? So again, just as a quick reminder, look at the head of the sternocleidomastoid. Uh, between the two heads of the sternocleidomastoid, you're looking for one head of the clavicle going up to the earlobe, and it should be in that plane there. And looking three finger whips from 
the angle of Louis going directly up at that 45 degree angle. So you need to make sure that your patient's positioned correctly. You need to make sure that you're looking in the right place and the kind of things that increase the JVP in a respiratory exam would be thinking about things like COPD, which can lead to core pulmonale, as we talked about last week. That increase in right sided pressure leads to a raised JVP. So if, if you can appreciate a raised JVP, be thinking along the lines of COPD. In our patient that we're looking at today, that's not the case. So they have a they have a normal JVP. Have a look at the face. So again, it's the eyes and the mouth that we're worried about mostly here. Look for signs of pallor. So uh, in um, a respiratory patient, that could be down to anemia. Um, potentially thinking about things like cancer in that case or anemia of chronic disease. Um, that should say ptosis um, and meiosis. So thinking about those, so ptosis is drooping of the eyelid. Meiosis is uh, narrowing of the pupil, so pinpoint pupil. And if you saw that on one side of the face, that could be an indication of an apical tumour. So interruption of the sympathetic chain by an apical tumour in the lung can lead to, so if it disrupts that sympathetic flow that goes back up to the head, you'll see that that sympathetic innervation, which helps control the muscles that lift your eyelid and helps the, the muscles that dilate the pupil. If you think that sympathetic is, is fight or flight responses, what's gonna help you run away better from something? Dilating the pupil, allowing more light in, so if that gets blocked, you're going to have pinpoint pupils and pinpoint pupils, drooping eyelids and also anhydrosis. So lack of sweat on the face It may not be something that you would pick up in the exam. It certainly shouldn't be something um, that you'd encounter in an OSCE at this stage. Um, but for the sake of SBAs, these are things that you might see in the face. Thinking about the mouth, central cyanosis. If somebody is hypoxic, they're going to be cyanose oral candidiasis. So if somebody is using a lot of steroid inhalers, so somebody who's asthmatic or may have COPD, you may see down to that steroid, that localized immunosuppression, they get oral candida. So have a good look at the tongue. Is there any sort of white patches adherent to the tongue that make you think candidiasis, diagnosis of asthma or COPD? Um, our patient doesn't have any of those as well. So move on to uh, inspecting the chest. So have a look, see what you can see. So these are some of this, we uh, we talked about some of the scars that you might see on the chest last week with a cardiology exam. Um, what you would see here is, so our patient has got, when you notice their chest, uh, we've exposed it and you can see a small scar on the right side of their chest. Now, the practicalities for actually doing this in person, what you should really do is get the patient to put their hands on their hips when you're looking at the chest because it opens up all of the sides. So when you're having a good look and you're, you're closely inspecting the chest, nothing's being hidden away here. So if you see for, for these diagrams, for each of the axillary and the posterolateral and the anterolateral, um, thoracotomy scars. Okay, you can see a fair bit here, but most of this is going to be going round to the side, and in the case of the posterolateral, the side and the back. For you to appreciate that scar, you need to get a good look at the axilla, and you do that by just getting them to put their hands on their hips and making sure that you have a good look at each side of their chest. In our patient, you notice that there's a little bit of a, a small scar uh, a lot like this actually on the right side of their chest and it'd be important as we go through this examination just bear in mind which side I'm talking about when we when we talk about our findings so at the moment what we've picked up is it's an older patient with some clubbing of the fingers and a small scar on the the right anterior and lateral side of their chest when we move on to feeling don't forget to feel the trachea because tracheal deviation is a really important sign. And 
what you can feel when you put your finger on the trachea. So put two of your fingers. So put your index finger and your ring finger onto the heads of the clavicles. Put your middle finger onto the trachea and just check that it's in the middle. Here is a really dramatic case of tracheal deviation. Do not expect to see this in somebody that you're examining, but you should see that your middle finger is equal between the ring finger and the index finger. Warm patients as well, it can be a little bit uncomfortable because you're pressing on their windpipe. Um, just make sure that you're, you're being considerate whilst you're examining people. It can be a bit uncomfortable. So warn them about that. Shouldn't be painful, but just let them know beforehand. Cricosternal distance. So you've got your, your hyo, hyoid bone in your throat. And then below that, you can feel a little notch, which is your uh, cricoid cartilage. And you're going from this nick at the top of the sternum to the cricoid cartilage with the patient 45 degrees that distance should be three to four finger whips and importantly it's the patient's fingers not your own so if you're in doubt use use the patient's fingers ask them can i just use your hand to measure this and what you're looking for there it can be signs of hyperinflation that you might sign might see in copd so in our patient what we can see is they have got a slightly deviated trachea this is quite dramatic but not to this extent but on our patient we've got an older patient with club fingers and they've got a small scar on the right side of their chest and their trachea is deviated towards the right side of their chest their apex beat is non-displaced and when we assess for chest expansion the way that we do that is you get a really good grasp around the chest so i've got a crossover on myself but if you basically if you pull tight so do this on your own chest at the moment take a deep breath in and out put your hands in, and, and note how when you take a deep breath in and out your hands should move out and apart so that's what you're testing for so when you're doing it on a patient you draw your hands round, getting good contact with your thumbs touching together when they're breathed out so when they've when they've taken a full expiration and their chest is at its smallest you draw your hands around so that your thumbs are floating and touching and your fingers and the heel of your hand is making good contact with the chest because that way when they take a big breath in these hands are going to come up and out if it's a normal exam and what you're looking for is differences in those movements you know is it only expanding a little bit is it expanding asymmetrically what are you going to find so on our patient we put our hands round nice and firmly they breathe all the way out thumbs are floating and touching together and when you ask them to take a deep breath in what you see your left hand which is on the right side of their chest doesn't move your right hand which is on the left side of their chest moves up and out like that so club fingers we've got a uh, tracheal deviation towards the right and we've got uh, no chest expansion on their the right side of their chest move on to percussion so you'll all have percussed some chest in your time just make sure that you're covering all of the key areas so percuss above the clavicle you can percuss on the clavicle as well you don't need to do that in the same way so your normal percussion technique you can practice on the table get your finger nice and firmly down i use my middle finger you want to flick the wrist and you're percussing the middle phalanx so it's not your fingertip it's the middle phalanx so that bone in the middle and really try and get a flicky action get good contact with that middle bone onto the chest and really get a nice flick to make a good sound with the the clavicle you can percuss there just by hitting on it it will resonate and then work your way down the chest in a nice methodical manner always go apex apex compare the two don't do one side and then the other because you'll have forgotten what you found on the other side by the time you get there 
think about the, the character of the sounds that you've heard, go on YouTube, search for some clips, find out what these things actually sound like if you need a refresher. Um, could, I, could I tell you exactly what Stony Doll sounds like? No, but if you listen to YouTube clips, you're going to be able to appreciate the difference between what, what Dull and what Stony Doll sounds like because they, they indicate different things. Stony Doll is that classical description that you get for plural effusion. And in our patient, going back to percussion, what we've got is dullness all through the right side of the chest or on the left side of the chest. It's what you would probably call a normal level of resonance throughout that left side of the chest. Auscultation, it's the same principle again. Make sure that you listen to the apices. Make sure that you do one side, then the other, and work your way down methodically. And again, go and, go and have a listen to what these fascicular breath sounds. So that's what you would normally hear uh, in throughout the lung fields, because that's where breath is going down into the smaller airways. Bronchial breathing, if you want to simulate on yourselves, put your stethoscope in, and listen over the trachea, because that's what bronchial breathing sounds like. Um, it's larger airways is what it sounds like. So go on YouTube, listen to what that might sound like and listen to what these added sounds like, crepitations, fine inspiratory crepitations and coarse crepitation sounds like. Um, you can you appreciate all of these just by listening to them on YouTube. Um, vocal resonance is the same thing. So tactile fremitus, vocal resonance are testing for the same thing. You don't need to do both. I think that vocal resonance is better. And you do that by saying uh, 99 or 99 um, over the chest and listening for that that reverberation. Um, in our patient, what we've got is absent breath sounds on the right side of the chest, normal breath sounds on the left side, and we've got uh, it's reduced vocal resonance on the right side, normal on the left. So you should be building up a picture of what's happened to this patient. So now we go on to the back. If you're limited for time, what the, the examiners may say is that just examine the back. However, if it's not written, what we're doing in an exam is probably start on the back. If, if you're doing it for real, tend to start on the front and then go on to the back. But if it's a limited time that you've got in the exam and you can only have, you're only confident you'll have the time to examine front or back, start on the back because you'll hear more. Um, there's less stuff in the way of the lungs. Um, do all of the things that you've just done in the same way. Um, and also whilst you're behind and you've got them sat forwards, this is a good opportunity to palpate the lymph nodes. So um, everybody has their own way of doing it. Don't do spider fingers. Um, what you should be doing is rolling the, the lymph nodes where they would be are moving methodically because you're trying to rub an enlarged lymph node against the surrounding tissue. So you should be feeling like this. And I would go submental, submandibular, preauricular. I would then come down the anterior cervical chain, do the uh, supraclavicular, and then I would go posterior cervical, postauricular to occipital at the back. And that's how I would normally do it. But as long as you're doing it in a way that is methodical and looks like you know what you're doing, you'll be absolutely fine. Our patient that we are seeing in front of us, when you look on the back, you notice that, that small scar at the front runs all the way in a curved fashion around the right side of their back. So move down to the legs, look for any swelling, um, any edema. So edema should be symmetrical, both sides. Um, if we've got unilateral calf swelling, it's not going to be anybody that you see in your exam, um, but that would suggest DVT and in the context of a respiratory exam, you're thinking PE. Erythema and the dosum, inflammatory reaction, look it up on uh, DermNet as a really nice uh, explanation. Um, can be associated with a number of respiratory conditions, so with TB, with sarcoidosis and with malignancy. So um, just know that if you saw somebody with that, there's a number of conditions that can be implicated. Again, probably not going to come up in your OSCE, but could be mentioned as a little bit of um, extra colour in a uh, multiple choice question. Our patient's legs are normal. So we finished up the exam. 
we've got all of our information that we've managed to tease out. Hopefully you've managed to think about what this patient uh, might have when we're looking at a scar on the chest. We've got absent breath sounds and uh, dull percussion throughout one side of the chest. We've got a trachea that's deviated towards those abnormalities and the patient has got club fingers and is slightly older. Um, so this is the exact examination that I have for my finals OSCE and it's all adding up to a person that has had surgical treatment for a lung cancer. If you see those things added together, you can be confident there's only going to be um, a couple of things they've had done. A scar of that size is probably going to be a total pneumonectomy on that side. Um, could be a lobectomy, but they tend to do that as a smaller incision. You'd see some, you'd see some smaller scars. It's often done um, with uh, video assisted thoracostomy or VAT. Um, if they're taking away only a part of the lung, you probably wouldn't expect a scar that dramatic. Um, but again, it's just trying to get you thinking about um, what you might see in your OSCE. Other things that can come up, as I said, pulmonary fibrosis, COPD, asthma are all, all good candidates for um, OSCE examination because they're people that have chronic conditions and they're quite stable. Right, so that's a quick fly through. Um, the respiratory exam again just thinking about the kind of patient that you might encounter what the signs you are that you that you might pick up so we're going to move on to some multiple choice questions similar format to last week i'm going to go through the questions with you talk about the right answer and talk about some of the wrong answers as well but we're going to do it through uh kahoot so if people can go to kahoot.it uh, on your mobile and i'm going to try and get this set up in just a second so the codes that you need if you can all go to kahoot.it and use this pin 1957962 one that's going to allow us to go through some of the questions and give you a little bit of feedback on what you know and what you need to do a little, a little bit more reading around I'll give you just a minute to do that and I'll be back in a sec. So we've got 18 people, one, two, three, four, five, six, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Still waiting on a few more. By my reckoning, we should have 17 people that are taking part in this quiz. So we've just got a few more to come in. And then what we're going to do for it go, is we'll go through um, first question. Kahoot likes quite short question stems. So what we're going to do, we're going to look at the presentation. We'll go through the question and then we'll, we'll use, we'll come back to Kahoot so that everybody can answer and get a bit of feedback on, on how they're doing. I'll just give you another minute and then we'll... Um, We'll move back over. We've almost got everybody that's watching. If you're having trouble logging into that, just 
jot down the game pin on your phone or on a piece of paper. And then I'm just going to open the presentation up because we're just going to talk through the question quickly. So you've still got a little bit of time before we get underway. 1957962. Okay, so. First question we're going to go through. So we've got a 22 year old man presents to the emergency department with breathlessness and pain in his chest on inspiration. This has started today. Man denies any recent trauma. He has no past medical history, takes no regular medications. He's a current smoker and has a five pack year history. He has a normal blood pressure. He has a normal heart rate. He has a normal respiratory rate. He has a normal temperature and he has good oxygen saturations. He's alert and he has reduced air entry on the left side. An X-ray shows a three centimetre rim of air between the lung margin and the chest wall. What is the most appropriate action to take? So we can either attempt needle decompression. We can send him home with an outpatient appointment to follow him up. We can insert a chest drain or we can call the thoracic surgeons and see if they'll come down and, uh, and help us out with this guy. So I'll give you a second just to, to think about all the information in that question. Try and figure out what it's, what it's trying to, to ask you. There's, there's a diagnosis to tease out here. And then once you've got the diagnosis, it's teasing out how do you triage the patient? And so you need to have a little bit of knowledge about um, what kind of condition this is and how we treat them. So what I'll do is take us over to Kahoot again. We're going to start this. Two, one. So bearing that question in mind, What's the most appropriate action to take? Okay. Okay, so we've got a split field and that's good because there are basically I can I can see why everybody has put the answers that they've done. Each of them in the right circumstance is a correct management for this condition. So we're talking about pneumothorax here, aren't we? This guy has got a sudden shortness of breath he's and he's got this rim of air on x-ray. So it's pneumothorax that we're dealing with here. What we need to do is work out what kind of pneumothorax it is and then how do we how do we move from there? So with pneumothorax, you look at it in two different ways. Is it primary or is it secondary? And what we mean by that is, has it happened without any underlying disease? So a primary pneumothorax is somebody, something that happens in a fit and healthy individual. A secondary pneumothorax is in somebody that has underlying lung disease. This is a 22 year old man. He's Got a bit of a smoking history, but he doesn't have a diagnosis of COPD. He doesn't have any history of lung disease. So this is primary pneumothorax. That basically means that inserting a chest drain is not going to be the right answer because in patients that have a primary pneumothorax, there are two initial steps that you take. He's got perfectly normal observations. So we could send him home, but the reason that we can't, like we could potentially send him home, but as soon as you do the x-ray and you see a three centimetre rim of air, he can't go home with that volume of air in his chest. Need to do a needle decompression first. If needle decompression fails in a primary pneumothorax, then we would move on to inserting a chest drain. If this was a one centimetre rib of air, say, then discharging without patient follow up would be absolutely fine. Do an X-ray, send him home, safety net him and say if you get more breathless, if you you know feel more unwell, come back and see us. Fine. 
eventually when these kind of things happen if it's small if it's one centimeter you'd expect that to just be slowly be reabsorbed inserting a chest strain comes in when you have secondary pneumothorax so if this was not a 22 year old man but this was a 65 year old man with a diagnosis of copd then gets a little bit more complicated so let me show you this algorithm which is from the uh british thoracic society so Prime pneumothorax we've talked about. Two centimetres is the cutoff. If it's bigger than that, or if he's symptomatic, so he was he was pretty okay, but he had a bigger than two centimetre um, pneumothorax, that's when you aspirate. If it wasn't any of those things, you can send him home and get him back. If we change those parameters to being a 65-year-old man and he's got COPD, then we start following this pathway. So it's a secondary pneumothorax. It's bigger than two centimetres. That's when we put a chest drain in. If it's also if he's symptomatic as well, if it's so, smaller than two centimetres, so if, if it was that 65-year-old man, COPD, he's got a one centimetre pneumothorax, then we would aspirate. If it's smaller than that, so we see a tiny little bit of air then what you would do in secondary disease is admit him, give high flow oxygen because that helps the lung re-expand and keep him in for 24 hours. Secondary pneumothorax is taken a lot more seriously because there's a lot more potential for things to go more wrong if somebody has underlying lung disease. In our fit, healthy 22-year-old man, we can potentially follow up as an outpatient, but due to the size we're going to aspirate first. So have an awareness of how seriously to treat it. Primary pneumothorax, secondary pneumothorax, that's going to help you work out what to do in the first case. And this is just uh, a written summary of some of that information. To be honest, it's probably less helpful than that, but primary important, secondary important, work it out and then use the size or the symptoms to help guide what your next step is. In primary pneumothorax, putting in a chest strain first isn't ever the first step in management. It's always a backup just in case that needle aspiration doesn't work. Okay, question two. A 56 year old female treated in hospital for a community acquired pneumonia three weeks ago. She attends the GP and she's still troubled by a cough. It's a dry cough, no longer productive. She has mild shortness of breath, no chest pain, no hemoptysis, no weight loss, no fevers. She is a non-smoker. She has a normal temperature, normal rest rate, normal heart rate, normal oxygen saturations and a normal blood pressure. Uh, she has a normal chest examination. So what's the most appropriate thing to do? Prescribe chlorophyllicin, refer to the respiratory clinic, repeat the chest x-ray urgently or reassure her and repeat the chest x-ray six weeks later. So we've got somebody that's had a chest infection, gone to their GP because they're still having symptoms. What are we going to do about it? Have a quick think about which of those options is the best thing to do. Have a look at those observations. Think, think about what you're going to do in this situation. And again, think about what I spoke last week about the cover test. Think if, if there were no things written down on there before I before you see those those options, what would what would be the thing that you would sort of first think about? And does it match up to, to any of the things that are written on the paper there as an option? If it does, you can have a, a, a good idea that you're on the right track. OK, so we'll tab over to the, the question now. Well done, EB. Right, question two. We've got a lady that's still having symptoms three weeks after her pneumonia. Okay, yeah, good work, everybody. So, the reason that we're going to reassure her is on paper, 
there is there is very little wrong with her. She's still having symptoms, but I think in GP, if you if you saw somebody that had all of these things, if their temperature was normal, rest rate was normal, heart rate, oxygen saturations, blood pressure, all of the things that we use to check if somebody's ill in hospital, they're all absolutely fine. The examination of their chest is normal, so if that examination is normal, you're not hearing creps on the chest, it doesn't sound like there's any consolidation, so okay, you, you may not be able to definitively say that, but she hasn't got a fever, she hasn't got creps in her chest that suggest that there's a load of muck in there still. She, her symptoms are that she's got some shortness of breath, but she's, she's not coughing stuff up anymore. All of this is fitting with somebody that's getting better rather than getting worse again. So doing a chest X-ray now is, is not going not gonna to tell you much. What you want to see is her continuing down this path of recovery. And the reason that I put this question in is basically just to give you an appreciation that actually pneumonia is a pretty serious, like you, you, they're a common thing that people come into hospital for. So maybe people underestimate them a little bit, but they take ages to get over. And NICE has a sort of written recovery pathway that you can tell people about for uh, community of pneumonia. So if you take a look at this, this is on NICE CKS. And it's got a nice clear idea of when you can tell patients, you know, you've had this chest infection, you're going to be feeling a bit out of sorts for a while, but you should get better over time. So one week, four weeks, six weeks, three months, six months, this is your pathway to recovery. And I think you, know, you can see now this is also a case with COVID. Like it's not just a case of having an acute infection and you have some antibiotics or you have some dexamethasone in the case of COVID and everything gets better, there is this protracted recovery and you're going to feel rough for a while. The reason why it's important to tell people that is so that they can work out with their GP. So this lady's gone back to the GP. If the hospital had been clearer with her when she left and said, you're going to still feel pretty breathless for a few more weeks. And then after that, you're going to feel a bit better in this way and that way. It avoids people unnecessarily seeking further medical advice. You can say to them, you know, if you feel more unwell again, like if you're having fevers, you need to go and see a doctor. It, it's just highlighting this question that safety netting is important. And in community acquired pneumonia, there is a nice clear set of instructions about what you can do. So other things, CAP is a really common topic for your exams because it's a really common condition. They want you to know about it. So know about questions to ask about how to examine what you would find on examination for common conditions think about your bedside tests so that is a urine dip that's an ECG that's a peak flow it's all things that you can do there and get an immediate result do any of those apply to a cap so with an ECG if you did one you might see sinus tachycardia because of uh, because of infection causing an increase in heart rate um, with a urine dip you might not see anything but you could send off urine for legionella antigen so that's something that you could be seeing in cap bloods think about what you're going to do in exams in oscars if you're going to say something always be able to justify it so full blood count we're going to see a raised white cell count in a pneumonia um, for use and ease we might see uh, a hyponatremia in Legionella. Um, just think about the different kinds of causative organisms in CAT because each of them will have different things in their history, different things in investigations that will point you towards one or the other. And it's a really common um, multiple choice question for pneumonia. Can you work out what's the most likely bacteria in this situation? Um, know how to treat it. Know that your CURB score correlates to empirical therapy. So CURB score being confusion, urea greater than seven, respiratory rate um, greater than 30, and uh, blood pressure of less than 90 systolic or 60 diastolic. And if they're over 65, zero to one on the CURB score, you can treat that with oral antibiotics, treat that in the community. Uh, two to three, you're looking at getting them into hospital, 
and four to five they're going to need to be in hospital and they're going to need IV antibiotics in order to treat it. Know roughly what that corresponds to for um, people that can take penicillin and people that can't take penicillin. So uh, in Salford, for example, where I work, um, patients that can't have penicillin and have a hospital acquired pneumonia, so we treat them as seriously as curb four or five caps, um, they get treated with IV levofloxacin. Um, just have an idea that somebody that's penallergic and has a cap score of zero and one, you wouldn't be giving them levofloxacin for that. Um, what you would probably do is give them uh, clarithromycin or something like that. Okay, next question. So, 70 year old man known to have COPD, admitted to the medical admissions unit with a suspected infective exacerbation. What should his target saturations be? So we haven't done a blood gas yet. He's got a diagnosis of COPD. What are his target sats? Should be a nice quick one. Maintaining the lead there, very nice. Right. I'm really pleased that that has got a split vote. Um, so this is the important difference for, I, I think like this is a really good one because you want to find out now. So there is clear guidance from NICE and from the British Thoracic Society about this point. So for COPD patients or anybody else that has a known risk factor for hypercapnia, so obesity, hypoventilation, cystic fibrosis, uh, the kind of scoliosis or kyphosis that can lead to CO2 retention. All of these patients that have targets out of 88 to 92 by default. And then what you can do is change that based on a blood gas result. So if you've got no information on a patient besides the fact that they tell you, I have COPD, set their target sats to 88 to 92 because if they do retain co2 you're going to shut off that hypoxic drive and you can make them more unwell if you then do a blood gas and you see that this person is not a co2 retainer they don't have that raised co2 on their blood gas then you can change it to the normal target saturations of 94 to 98 percent but if they got that diagnosis and you don't have blood gas information, set it to 88 to 92. Those oxygen saturations are not are not going to kill somebody. Somebody with COPD, it may not be ideal for them if they're not a CO2 retainer to be at 88 to 92, but it's not going to be lethal. However, if somebody is a CO2 retainer and you haven't got blood gas results and you've set their oxygen to 94 to 98, you can make them more unwell by shutting off that hypoxic drive and meaning they're not they're not breathing as well as they should be so related to that a 55 year old man admitted to the emergency department with an acute exacerbation of copd he is cyanosed tachycardic and his oxygen saturations on room air are 58 percent what is the most appropriate initial oxygen therapy so nasal cannulae venturi mask simple face mask non rebreather mask. OK, so information there. He's come into ED. He has COPD. He's cyanose, tachycardic, SATS 58. What are we going to put him on to begin? Okay, good. Trying to catch people out there with um, with the last question. So, the difference in this situation, man is cyanose, tachycardic, that's a 58. He's really unwell. 
this is an emergency situation. So he needs high flow oxygen. It doesn't really matter if he's a retainer. He's going to die of hypoxia before he dies of hypercapnia in this situation. So that's a 56. Get oxygen on and you can titrate it down later, but he needs to get some oxygen in. Otherwise, it's going to lead to him arresting. So an emergency situation, the fact that he has COPD is less of a consideration. Get that oxygen on high, stabilise him, and then we can worry about if he's a retainer or if he's not. 88 to 92 versus 94 to 98. So those, those two points do fit together. I mean, what's, what's going to make you prioritise is how unwell the patient is. In that first question, infective exacerbation, but stable. So set it at 88 to 92, use a Venturi, do an AVG, and then find out if you can change those saturations. If this man that's coming in, he'll have been blue lighted in, he'll be really unwell, whack on 15 litres of oxygen and you can worry about retention or not later on. So again, COPD, really common condition, something that you, you're going to need to know a lot about for your exams. Again, think about the kind of bedside test, blood, special tests. So with COPD, um, it is diagnosed by spirometry. Um, the kind of people that you're going to be thinking about it in are um, mostly older patients, mostly smokers. But like I said earlier on, um, occasional rare things, and this would be like SBA topics, could hint at something in a younger patient. So if you're, if you're thinking along those lines, you need to just know the symptoms of the shortness of breath, wheeze, tendency to have exacerbations and infections, and know that spirometry is how we're going we're gonna to diagnose it. So Grading the FEV1 and the FEC and the FE, so force expiratory volume in one second. That is when you get somebody to take a breath out, how much are they getting out in one second compared to the total amount um, that they can get out? So that's the FVC. FVC is the functional vital capacity. That's your 100% of what you can breathe out. And in that first second, that's your FEV1. So the ratio is important for diagnosing COPD. So if your ratio is less than 7, uh, 0 0.7, then that is su suggestive of COPD. And then you use an FEV1 as a percentage to work out the severity. So... FEV1 over FVC is just for diagnosis. Grading the severity is down to the FEV1 alone. So 80% mild, 50 to 79, uh, moderate, 30 to 49, severe, and an FEV1 of less than 30%. So if basically if your lungs have got no, if they're very slowly forcing air out, that's very severe COPD. Know about how it's managed acutely and know about how it's managed chronically. So the kind of things that people need when they have an exacerbation are um, antibiotics and steroids. Know about the indications for each because some people will, if they've got increasing wheeze and breathlessness, they may just need steroids. If they've got more purulent sputum, may need antibiotics as well. Um, know about like how you work those kind of people up and how you manage it chronically as well. So knowing about the um, the pathway of the various inhaled medications that people need and know about as well what the what the longer term um, outcomes are like, what they may need further down the line. Um, so talking about these kind of things here, smoking cessation is going to be the best possible thing that people can do for COPD um, is really key knowledge. You'll often see SBA saying like, what's the, what's the best initial treatment for COPD? And it'll give you a bunch of inhalers. And if it mentions smoking cessation, you know, that's going to be the best thing because stopping the problem, people can recover lung function by, um, stopping smoking. Inhalers are just they're not, they're not treating the root cause of the problem. So getting people to stop smoking is key to advise people about. Um, exercise tolerance is an important consideration in these people because it's going to be um, uh, key to 
deciding what kind of things they can have in terms of their treatment. So there is the MRC dyspnea scale um, that can lead to, if it, depending on what grade they are, it can lead to referral for things like pulmonary rehab. Um, have an awareness of some of the indications for long-term oxygen therapy, um, because that's for really advanced COPD. Um, know about some of the, so like certain blood pHs are indications. So if somebody has a pH, I think of less than 7.2, um, then they would qualify for long-term oxygen therapy. And there's a few things that if they have it uh, slightly higher than that, so 7.2 to 7.3, I think alongside other things like um, people can have uh, a reactive um, increase in their uh, hematocrit. So they have more red blood cells to try and maximize the amount of oxygen that they can carry. That's a late stage sign of COPD. It's not a, not a good sign. Um, also be aware that people can't have oxygen therapy if they're still smoking because they will um, set themselves on fire. Um, so cannot have long-term oxygen if they're still smoking. Um, right, moving on to the next question. 22-year-old uh, woman attends the emergency department following an exacerbation of asthma. She currently only uses a salbutamol inhaler. Her symptoms settle quickly with a nebulizer and you give the patient advice on inhaler technique. What should you discharge it with? So amoxicillin, beclometazone, prednisolone for 14 days, prednisolone five days and beclometazone inhaler. So young woman, asthma exacerbation, She's currently only using salbutamol. Let's think about, is that enough for her? And what are we going to send her home with after we've done all of the appropriate advice? Okay, so we will come over to our questions. Good, good, that was well answered. So the reason that we want to do both of these things, you need to have a little bit of knowledge about how asthma is treated. So in this question, she had an exacerbation. At the moment, she's only using salbutamol, so that's a reliever inhaler. It doesn't mention anything about a preventer. If she's had an exacerbation, that's bad. Obviously, people can be really unwell with an asthma attack. Well-controlled asthma, people should not be coming in to hospital. If she is coming into hospital, that suggests that her current regime is not good enough. So we're going to need to step it up. At the moment, she is only on a reliever. So the, the most sensible thing to do is add in a preventer medication. There's a couple of answers here that do not mention preventer medication. So amoxicillin. She hasn't got any symptoms of infection. It's not going to stop her from this potentially happening again in future. What you could be doing if, if infection is contributing to this exacerbation, what you're going to do is treat that for a few days and this problem could well come back in future. So A is not going to be the right answer. C is going to help with the symptoms now. It's a high dose of steroids. 14 days is much too long to be honest so the the duration of steroid treatment is five days for any exacerbation of asthma prednisolone 40 milligrams is a really high dose for 14 days you then need to start tapering that down as well um it's overkill for asthma and also again once once she's off of it there's not going to be any lasting effects it'll be out of her system and she'll be at risk of it happening again so Prednisolone 40 milligrams is also wrong because there isn't any step up in treatment based on this. So then it comes down to a bit of a toss up between B and C. Basically comes down to knowing that if somebody has had an exacerbation 
um, you need to send them home with oral steroids. So Pred, 40 milligrams, high dose, that's going to reduce the inflammation that causes the, the bronchoconstriction that leads to the symptoms that she's having. Hit it with that high dose steroid and reduce the inflammation, reduce the risk of her coming in again. And then we're changing her regime to make sure that she's not going to come in uh, with an exacerbation again. So asthma, again, another really big topic because it's common. Lots of people have it and it leads to um, a lot of morbidity and sometimes more like mortality. So again, know about how it's diagnosed, what you're going to do to investigate it, what features in the history. So know about that diurnal rhythm. If you give somebody their, their asthma diary, know how the symptoms get better and worse over the course of the day. Um, know about using peak flow, but also um, other things that are becoming increasingly common. So um, if, you, if you look at NICE CKS, there's a variety of tools that are used to help diagnose asthma. There is no definitive test, but there, there are more weapons in the arsenal of the GP in order to help work out whether it's asthma or not. Um, so, for example, fractional exhaled nitric oxide is something that is uh, becoming increasingly common. Um, bronchodilator reversibility testing is another thing. Um, all of these might be suggested in questions in order to point you towards a diagnosis of, of asthma. Know about how to, to classify them. So, moderate, severe and life-threatening categories of um, asthma attack. So, um, you can look these up. I won't go into detail with them, but the way that you, when you see the life-threatening ones, they they sound really dramatic. So things like um, tiring, things like silent chest. If if somebody, if you're not hearing wheeze on the chest of somebody that's come in with an asthma attack, that's really really bad because what that means is the inflammation of their their bronchioles has gotten there's so much inflammation and tightness now that air is just not passing those airways so have a, have a look at those categories what I, I would recommend remembering for things like the peak flow in any question that you get about an exacerbation of asthma they're going to give you multiple clues to the diagnosis but just have a few things that you can hang it on so that you can you can work out which category it might be and how, how seriously to treat it. Um, if somebody's got silent chest, if they're becoming drowsy or confused because of the, the, the rise in the CO2 in their, in their blood, those are the kind of things where your management is going to be leaning more towards call ITU, call an anaesthetist, hit them with all of those later stage IV medications rather than in our lady that's just coming in this last question who we've just given some salbutamol nebs you know have an idea of which pathway you're going to follow um, based on what clues you get given in the question um have an idea about the chronic management of it as well so it's it's a bit more complicated nowadays I'm not going to go through it all now but basically starting from our patient that we've seen here who's on salbutamol inhaler a short term uh, a short acting beta agonist and how they titrate up with starting with a low dose inhaled steroid and then you have the addition of your leukotriene receptor antagonists have an idea of how those steps go up through um, the management of asthma inhaler technique it's a really common oski actually um, showing people how to correctly use their inhalers and what each one is for be able to explain in plain english what this is the blue inhaler this is what this does. You use this to relieve your breathlessness when you have it. The brown one is a preventer inhaler. So you need to take this whether or not you're having symptoms and then show them, you know, holding it level, breathing all the way out and then having a deep breath in. And as you start that breath, that's when you do the spray or if they have a spacer, show them how to do it. So spray 10, 10 deep breaths in and out. Be sure that you know how to explain to somebody confidently because if it comes up, those those OSCE stations are really easy to get good marks in. And again, I have an idea of some of these other considerations. So again, smoking is really bad for people with asthma. Any respiratory disease, just know that smoking cessation is absolutely key for making people better. Um, a really common topic, so you need to know this well. Right. Um,
So you see a 65 year old man who has been experiencing shortness of breath, especially after exertion, dry cough. He's not coughing up blood. He's not feeling unwell, doesn't have a fever, lost some weight. He smokes 20 a day for the past 40 years. No other medical history. And he has clubbed fingers. So I'll, I'll give you a minute to look through this because this isn't a, it's not a straightforward question. We're thinking about finger clubbing. So which of these conditions, based on this history, has led to that presentation? Got club fingers. He's 65. He's not feverish. He's not unwell. He's lost a bit of weight. He's got a smoking history. But otherwise, no medical problems. Have a think about what that might be. Okay. And uh, that is that picture is fingers and clubbing. The the Kahoot system for searching clip art is is quite fun. <laughs> so difficult question this one. And what I'm going to do, I'll talk you through each of the answers and tell you why it's idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, and it's not each of the others. So, difficult question. Let's have a look again at the information that we've got here. He's a 65 year old male. He has shortness of breath, especially after exertion. He has a dry cough, no hemoptysis, not feeling unwell, not feverish, weight loss, smoking history, club fingers. So, bronchiectasis, how does that present? That would be somebody that has sort of frequent problems with um, breathlessness, wheeze, productive cough. It's going to be like productive cough is key to a diagnosis of bronchiectasis. What you've got is um, it's often in people who have a history of chest infections, particularly in childhood, that history of infection damages the airways and it leads to um, impaired movement of the cilia. So those, those hairs that beat infection away, protect your body from getting further infection. And it leads to hypersecretion of like mucus. So bronchiectasis, you get lots of mucus, lots of sputum production, this sort of hacking cough, um, and they will be prone to infective exacerbations of their bronchiectasis. This guy here, He's got some shortness of breath, but it clearly says here a dry cough. So that would immediately make you think that this is probably not going to be bronchiectasis. For the other things, no hemoptysis, mm, can see it. Tapped over. So weight loss, again, I mean, if it was late stage bronchiectasis, it could be becoming cachectic, but again, it's not really likely. Key, the clincher here for it not being bronchiectasis is dry cough because it's typical to be coughing stuff up. COPD, there's loads of it going for in favour of COPD here. So he's short of breath, particularly after exertion, dry cough. Yeah, it can be dry most of the time with sort of productive phases as well when uh, you have an, an infective exacerbation. There's no evidence of fever and that could fit with a dry cough as well. This could be a guy that's developing COPD, losing weight, yeah, late stage COPD, you can lose weight and um, he's got a smoking history, so that all fits. He has clubbing of his fingers. COPD does not cause clubbing on its own. So um, this question in here is basically as a point. There is loads of things that point towards COPD, but this is a, is a clincher. The causes of finger clubbing, COPD is not one of them. If he had an underlying cancer, Absolutely, that could be right. If the smoking that he'd been doing for 40 years had led to a lung malignancy, 
you could see club fingers. But lung cancer is not on here. That's a bit too much of a reach. There is a there is a better option here, and that's idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. So he's the right age demographic for pulmonary fibrosis. Exertional shortness of breath is typical. Dry cough as well. Weight loss can be seen in cases of pulmonary fibrosis and smoking history often goes along with pulmonary fibrosis as well. It is not directly causative in the way that it is for COPD, but it is a risk factor. And finger clubbing is typical for pulmonary fibrosis. That's the real differentiator in this question. COPD doesn't cause finger clubbing, pulmonary fibrosis does, and it fits with a lot of these boxes. TB, your typical TB history, it's a patient who has fevers, weight loss, night sweats, chronic history. There's a few things that go that way in this question, but there's too much going against the diagnosis of TB. He's not feeling unwell. He's not feverish. He's not coughing up blood. Again, it's not entirely impossible that this guy could have something like TB, but there is a better unifying diagnosis for this stem. So IPF is the right answer. This is just uh, some of that. And again, so fine inspiratory uh, crepitations is the, the classic examination finding for IPF. Um, as I've said, that could be something that comes up in an OSCE station because these patients tend to have a very slow progression of their disease. Um, you might have somebody like this in your exam. And these are some of the respiratory causes of clubbing, some of the cardiac causes of clubbing and some of the other causes of clubbing as well. So you will know in this list, COPD is not in there. All of the rest of the causes that we talked about in that question, bronchiectasis, TB, uh, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis can cause clubbing. The, un the underlying reason for clubbing is not fully understood. Um, can be is thought to be down to some inflammatory processes. Um, you can read more about it if you like, or you can be happy with the explanation that basically nobody has definitively um, found out the reason for uh, clubbing of the fingers. Um, COPD doesn't cause it is the key takeaway for that one. Okay, so this question, we've got a 23 year old woman and she has a two month history of cough and intermittent fever. What is the most likely diagnosis? So I want you to take a look at the, the stem of that question, but also the x-ray because the x-ray is key. There are a few different findings and we're gonna go through them in just a second, uh, but take a look at that and tell me what you think the most likely diagnosis is. Okay, bear those options in mind. Oh, hello's on fire at the moment. Congratulations. Okay, so 23 year old woman. That's the history. That's the chest x ray. What is the answer? Okay, so this is this is TB, and I will I will show you why. So we've got a few examination findings here. So chronic history, two months, cough, intermittent fever. So that on its own could be a number of things. Again, what you would probably expect to see is more. It would probably mention more of a history of productive cough with um, with bronchiectasis. Um, intermittent fever, uh, probably less likely. I mean, what you would expect to see is infective exacerbation of bronchiectasis, which sort of leads you to these kind of like fulminant episodes, whereas this is hinting at more of a, a subtle thing. TB could definitely fit with that picture. Cough, intermittent fever, so as we said, fever, weight loss, night sweats. 
that's a kind of fever that comes on and off with TB. Aspergilloma could fit with something like this. It looks different on um, chest X-ray. So some of you may have picked up so these findings here. You may have thought that that might be an aspergilloma, but it looks slightly different on chest X-ray. Um, I don't have a photo actually of an aspergilloma in this presentation. You may want to do just a quick Google to see what um, an aspergilloma looks like on chest X-ray. And with a community acquired pneumonia, it could actually, you could have somebody that has two months of cough and fever. In a young person as well who might have a, a higher physiological reserve, they could have a chest infection that kind of um, sits un, unnoticed for that long. Um, it's less likely, they tend to be more acute than that. What really clinches this diagnosis is the radiographic finding. So the, the, the appearance of this chest X-ray is what tips you towards TB because there are three different things that are suggestive of TB. So upper zone consolidation tends to be more typical. So caps tend to fill the lower zones of the chest. We've got a cavitating lesion here. So the way that, that TB sort of um, sits in a latent fashion and you get these gone complex and then cavitating nodules. So this here is a cavitating lesion for TB. And um, you can see here this hilum is very pronounced. If you compare it to the other side, this is hyalur lymph adenopathy. And all of those findings on chest X-ray are pretty typical for TB. So the reason that TB is the right answer here is down to that kind of chronic history, but there are lots of typical findings on the chest X-ray as well. So again, TB is a common topic. It is um, very, very common worldwide and is, is less, co less common in the UK, but is still a significant burden of disease um, in inner city areas where you've got a high population density and um, first and second generation immigrant populations. TB is something that you will need to know about. Um, who gets it? So um, basically people that are exposed to it know about the, the duration of exposure, so household contacts are the people most at risk. It's a notifiable disease, so if somebody comes in with it, you need to let uh, Public Health England know that a patient is being treated for TB. Um, and the kind of people that present with fulminant TB are people who um, often you will get, so people can be exposed to it, and I would imagine that a number of respiratory consultants that work with patients with TB have been exposed to it, um, often won't present with um, primary TB, they can have latent TB, so TB infection gets sealed off in the lung. Um, the people that present with fulminant TB tend to be immunosuppressed in some way, so that's older patients, that is patients that are HIV positive. And if you see somebody who's got a diagnosis of TB, it's an indicator condition for HIV. Diagnosis of TB should prompt you to test for HIV as well. Um, the homeless are at high risk and any other reason for immunosuppression. So um, if people are on immunosuppressant medications, for example, in treatment resistant Crohn's or ulcerative colitis, if you're using uh, biologic agents that are powerful immunosuppressants, you need to test people for TB before you start them on those medications. Because if somebody is going to be given a biologic and they've got a latent TB infection, you risk giving them fulminant TB, which is obviously going to be really bad. So you need to make sure that you test people before that. So risk factors for getting florid TB are being immunosuppressed in some way. How do you get rid of it? Um, classically, it's ripe treatment. So rifampicin, isoniazid, pyrazinamide, ethambutol, all four of those for two months, and then rifampicin and isoniazid for another four months. However, drug resistant, multi-drug resistant, extremely drug resistant TB is all becoming more of a problem. The treatment has got more complicated, at your level, you wouldn't be necessarily expected to know about those kind of things. Just be aware that these four drugs are the mainstay of treatment for TB and they each have side effects as well. 
So what I would recommend is know about how, if somebody's going to be started on treatment, what monitoring needs to be done for these medications and what side, what common side effects they have. So the classical ones for rifampicin are that it's an enzyme inducer, so it increases, uh, so it reduces the efficacy of the the combined pill. So if somebody's taking oral contraception and you start them on rifampicin, they need to be aware that their contraception may not work. They need to use something else in the meantime as well. Um, it's also the one that very famously turns your secretions orange. So you patients may notice that their pee turns orange, um, their tears turn orange. Patient, patients that have soft contact lenses will see their contact lenses turn an orange colour if they're taking rifampicin. Um, isoniazid causes peripheral neuropathy and can cause uh, liver damage. So you need to monitor their LFTs before and during treatment. Um, and you need to give them um, vitamin supplementation to reduce the risk of neuropathy. Uh, Ethambutol uh, is associated with eye damage. So you need to have an eye test before you start this treatment regime. Um, also, just have an awareness that TB doesn't just spring up in the lungs. It can also go elsewhere. Uh, I've put military TB, that should be miliary TB. So that's um, a different kind of appearance on a chest x-ray. So if you compare this, this is TB in one area. Miliary TB um, is like lots of little white dots throughout the, the fields of the lung um, and doesn't have a good prognosis. Uh, you can have TB meningitis, you can have spinal TB, you can have gastrointestinal TB. Um, in SBAs, look for a stem that suggests the kinds of patients. We talked about the risk factors for fulminant TB. Look for some suggestion of high risk populations. So immigrant populations, immunosuppressed patients may have a respiratory history and then they may have symptoms that suggest GI or spinal or, or meningitis. Right, so moving on to the next question. Uh, overweight 49 year old male has had four episodes of hemoptysis in the last two weeks 30 pack year history uh purple strii on his abdomen reduced air entry in the right lung a chest x-ray shows a well-defined opacity in the right middle zone and we've got some derangement of his um cortisol and his ACTH and it's not suppressed with a high dose dexamethasone test and these are his blood tests so we've got hyponatremia we have got uh everything else is in the normal range so we are testing here with this well-defined opacity in the lung and these symptoms what is the most likely diagnosis here so I'll give you a second just to just to study the different elements in that history and in the blood results. And then we will just tab over to the question just to let you guys answer. That was blown away. Very nice. So, nice work, guys. So this is this is one that's exam technique is less helpful here. You you need to have a bit of knowledge in order to be able to answer that question, and most of you have answered that right, which is really good. So. There are some different paraneoplastic syndromes. So in patients that have lung cancer, these cancers can secrete things that cause um, like endocrine changes. So small cell lung cancer, squamous cell lung cancer and adenocarcinoma are your three main types of lung cancer that you'd be expected to know about. Cushing's disease is not as wrong as you might think. It can cause a very similar presentation in ACTH and cortisol to that. However, there are things that will help you tell that apart. So small cell lung cancer is the right answer. Small cell lung cancer, what you see is an ectopic release of ACTH, which causes 
Cushing syndrome and ectopic release of ADH, antidiuretic hormone, which causes a dilutional hyponatremia. If we look at those blood results, we've got hyponatremia, we've got a high ACTH, which is being spit out by the tumour itself, and that high ACTH causes a high cortisol. The cortisol is not being suppressed with high dose dexamethasone, so I will show you the, the details from video in a second. Not going to watch it now, but if you, because I know I still struggle to get my head around um, endocrine axes and all that kind of thing, you guys preparing for an exam probably going to be a lot better at this than I am. I could waffle on for 10 minutes or I could just link you to a video that's going to explain it a lot better than I could. But basically, cortisol not reacting to high dose dexamethasone indicates it's from an ectopic source. So it's coming from a cancer. And in this case, it's, it's small cell lung cancer. Squeamer cell releases ectopic parathyroid hormone releasing protein, which causes hypercalcemia. B, if, if you get a question, I, I think it's, it's unlikely, it's not key knowledge, but just be aware it's not parathyroid hormone that is released by squamous cell lung cancer. It is related protein um, and leads to the same effect of causing a raise in your calcium. Adenocarcinoma, not typically associated with paraneoplastic syndromes, doesn't lead to um, derangements in the same way that these conditions do. Um, and again, it's, it's common in smokers, but these are more typically associated with smoking. If you look at the difference between incidents for smokers and non-smokers in small cell and screamer cell, heavily favours smokers. Adenocarcinoma is the most common primary lung cancer in people who do not smoke, and that's important knowledge. If you need a refresher of Cushing syndrome, Cushing's disease, and ectopic ACTH secretion, and how to differentiate these, search this in YouTube. So I was looking through a few videos yesterday um, dexamethasone suppression test, zero to finals. There is a guy who gives a very nice explanation of how both low and high dose dexamethasone tests cause different responses in the body and why. So other things that you need to know, what are the risk factors? So we've talked about smoking, um, it's absolutely key. Other things like age and uh, asbestos exposure are other important things to know. Um, so uh, if somebody smokes and has been exposed to asbestos, those risk factors work together and they have a massively increased risk of uh, uh, getting lung cancer. Um, know about the, the two week wait referral criteria. So if somebody is coming in with, you know, weight loss, hemoptysis, has a smoking history, know about what things should prompt you to refer people down that two week wait pathway, because um, that's very testable in an exam. Um, how do you investigate? So the key thing, if somebody's come into the GP surgery and they've told you, I've, they've got a 40 pack year history and I've got this sudden hacking cough, I'm coughing up blood. Um, the investigation of choice, they're going to need a contrast CT um, and you should really do CT tap in that situation, but just make sure that you know that con CT with contrast is not going to be, a chest x-ray is not going to cut it because if somebody has a small lesion, you're not necessarily going to pick it up on chest x-ray. It needs to be CT and it needs to be um, with added contrast as well. And I have a rough idea of basic management. You don't need to get into fast details about um, which chemotherapeutic agents are best, but have a rough idea that early stage cancers, surgery is usually good. If it's spread, surgery is not an option. Also, particularly note that small cell lung cancer, the evidence for surgery is not, not very good. It basically has to be um, T1, M0, M0. It has to be really early stage for small cell. The mainstay of treatment for small cell lung cancer is chemo and radiotherapy. Um, for adenocarcinoma and squamous cell, you can use surgery to slightly more advanced stages, but... Um, for anything that's metastasized, chemo is going to be your, your mainstay. So have an idea of how different cancers are, are managed. Uh, question here. So we've got a 70 year old homeless woman uh, found unconscious, history of alcohol excess. Uh, on arrival, she appears intoxicated and confused. On examination, you know, heavy tar staining of the fingers and a pulse of 110, which is irregularly irregular. 
Respirate 16, oxygen sat's 92, breath sounds reduced on the left side of the chest. Chest x-ray is pictured below. What is the most likely diagnosis? Okay, so seven year old woman, infused, tar stains on the fingers, tachycardic, she's got a normal respirate and slightly low oxygen saturations, reduced breath sounds on the left side, and on the chest x ray, we can see a whiteout on the left side of the chest. So let's have over and tell me what you think is going on here. So we've got one more question after this. That's the chest x-ray, white out on the left side. What's the answer? Pneumonectomy. Yes, yeah, so I'm checking to see if anybody was paying attention to me earlier on from my, uh, my OSCE presentation. So, there is a reason that this is uh, pneumonectomy rather than any of the other options. So there's not really much in the SEM actually that is a giveaway. Essentially what this boils down to is knowledge of this combined with this. So this is the trachea and it's deviated towards the whiteout. Trachea is in a whiteout trachea position is is key to the diagnosis so we've got a white out here it can be deviated towards it can be in the middle or it can be deviated away and you basically just need to have a rough idea of what things fall into those categories so from this stem it could really be any one of those things um the reason that it can't be the other three answers, a pleural effusion, you would see if you had a, a pleural effusion over one side of the chest, that trachea would be pushed away from the effusion. So if you think about the pleura, that, that thin space between your lung and the chest wall, if that starts filling up with fluid and it's compressing the lung tissue, that fluid filling up is going to shift. If I've got on my left side like this, like this woman that we're seeing here, fluid is filling up this side of the chest it's going to start shunting the chest contents over to the right side with that fluid and that's why you would see the trachea deviated away from the white out with pneumonia and with mesothelioma if you see white out of the chest it tends to be central so with pneumonia it's infection inside the lung it doesn't tend to cause a mass effect that that moves um the trachea away so I, again alongside pleural effusion things that can move it away are tumors with malignant effusion so a tumor itself can push the trachea away from um the side of the whiteout mesothelioma uh, the exact reasons for that i'm not actually sure but just FYI, um, trachea tends to be central if mesothelioma is the underlying reason for whiteout. With pneumonectomy, as we talked about in the patient that we examined before, if you take this lung away, there is a load of extra space in the chest. So what happens is this lung hyperinflates as a compensatory mechanism. This it goes beyond the midline as a result and this just this fills up with fluid as artifact. So lung is taken out and you just tend to get secretions that fill up this side of the chest. Um, so in pneumonectomy, the trachea deviates towards the side of the whiteout. And the other thing that can cause that as well is um, total collapse of the lung. And you tend to see that if somebody has been intubated improperly. So Somebody has an endotracheal tube that goes down all the way into a bronchus 
Um, that is too far and the pressure dynamics mean that the, the lung collapses entirely and again the other lung will expand to, to fill the void that's, that's caused by um, that collapse. So in this question, unfortunately a lot of the information at the top is irrelevant. What is key to this is, is knowing that the trachea helps you work out what the, the cause of a whiteout might be. So the, the hints here basically are that this lady has tar staining. She's probably had a lung out for some form of lung cancer. And final question, 26 year old Caucasian man on a general surgical ward, three days post-operatively, he has been complaining of a sudden onset of shortness of breath and dry cough. He has BMI of 36 and is using his PCA for pain relief. Um, his arterial blood gas results follow here. So, pH, PA2, PCA2, and bicarbonate. Based on the info information provided, what is the most likely diagnosis? Okay. So, based on that blood gas, based on the symptoms that he's got, what is going to be the reason that he has got sudden onset shortness of breath? So, Okay, good. So, again, we'll talk about why the other things can't be the right answers. Let's, uh, let's just tab through and take a look at the podium. Who has won for this week? So, good performance from EB. Nice work from Joe. And it's come down to, it looks like the time for response is what's won it for Ella. Joe's had a, Joe's had a late rally, but just not quick enough on the buzzer. Um, what I would say as well, guys, as well, like these questions are designed to test you a bit, educate you. If you've not scored loads of them right, please don't worry too much. Your exams are still a way off. And I'm picking these to, to illustrate key points. So these are the kind of things that I'm just using to talk around topics. I've purposely picked quite difficult questions and also things that I think um, to illustrate things that might trip you up. So like with the, the saturations for COPD, the reason I'm putting that in is because not necessarily that it's going to be something that you'll be asked an exam, but it's like a fundamental thing that I think is often misunderstood. So what, what we're hoping to see is that we get closer to the exams and these kind of questions will trip you up less and less. So well done to Ella, to Joe, to, to EB. Um, we will carry on with using this kind of thing uh, in the future just to, to make sure that you're sort of testing and learning and seeing how you improve over time because that's what we want to see. So back to this final question, 26 year old man, there's a few things in here that tip us towards a diagnosis of pulmonary embolism. Now, unlike the last question where essentially the right answer hinged on one thing and that's do you know about the trachea? deviation or not there's there's a few different clues in this one that are going to tip us towards the right answer so <clears throat> obesity hypoventilation syndrome he's got a high bmi it's unlikely at the age of 26 and with what is a a bmi of 36 but you know people nowadays have bmis that go up to 40s 50s even 60s um it's unlikely at the age of 26 that he would have developed obesity hypoventilation syndrome. Even if you didn't know that, hypoventilation suggests not blowing off CO2. You should know that with an increased rest rate, you blow off CO2. If you're not breathing rapidly, 
If you're hypoventilating, that leads to a buildup of CO2. A buildup of CO2 leads to more CO2 in your bloodstream, and that favours the production of carbonic acid. And more carbonic acid means to you get a lower pH. Here we can see that this man has got a higher pH. He's got slightly alkalotic blood. So obesity hypoventilation syndrome wouldn't produce a picture like this. What you might expect to see with obesity hypoventilation is a type 2 respiratory failure. So type 2 respiratory failure is a low oxygen, which we do have. But here we've got a low CO2 and in type 2 respiratory failure, you see a high CO2. And based on that, you get acidosis. So you get a, a low pH. And obesity hypoventilation syndrome as well is a chronic thing that doesn't present with sudden onset shortness of breath. So that's why that's not right. Opiate toxicity. There is a few things. So again, you would expect opiate toxicity to produce um, a reduced rest rate, leading to CO2 retention, leading to acidosis. Another thing that goes against that, PCAs are actually really, really safe. Um, they give tiny little doses of IV opiate. It is very, very difficult to overdose on uh, a PCA. Um, people can feel nauseous and they can feel sick, but opiate toxicity and um, the, the kind of um, respiratory depression that you see with opiate overdose just doesn't really happen with, with a PCA um, because of the, the small doses that you're giving each time. So opiate toxicity for a number of reasons isn't right in this situation. Hospital acquired pneumonia. Now, sudden onset shortness of breath. I mean, it has to present at some time. Sudden onset often suggests something a little bit more. A sudden onset is not something you typically see written down for somebody that had hospital acquired pneumonia. Three days post-operatively is probably a little bit too soon for hospital acquired pneumonia. Um, he's uh, hospital acquired pneumonia as well for just duration wise um, has to be five days or more after admission. Uh, it could be that he's been in for a couple of days beforehand, um, but there's other things as well, like a dry cough that don't really fit um, with that picture. Pulmonary embolism, there's lots of things in this question that favour that. He's a post-op patient. He has sudden onset shortness of breath. He has a high BMI and he's had, um, he's had, sorry, said that already. Um, so high BMI post-operatively, risk factors for developing um, venous, thrombo venous thromboembolism. Um, sudden onset shortness of breath is typical for a PE. And what you're seeing, so you, you've got a blood clot that has um, caused blockage of one of the vessels in the lungs. That leads to ventilation, perfusion, mismatch, and type one respiratory failure. So type one is just hypoxia. It doesn't have hypercapnia. He's got low oxygen because he's not perfusing his lung as well as he should be. In order to try and bring his oxygen up, what he's gonna do is hyperventilate. So he's gonna have an increased respirate that increased respirate is going to blow off CO2. So he's transferring gas well. That CO2 is uh, being blown off, is reducing. So that acid in his blood is, is coming down. So as a result, we see an alkalosis. This is a respiratory alkalosis because his, his bicarb is in the normal range. There's no metabolic factor to the pH that we're seeing here. So... All of this fits with all of the pieces of evidence that we've got, post-operative, high risk factor for BMI. Also, uh, as a side point, three days post-op, it fits right in the window for a PE. Um, sooner than this, you probably wouldn't see a PE, but sort of like three to five to seven days is like prime window for, for having a PE after an operation. Um, so all of this here fits with um, pulmonary embolism. So that is the end of the questions. Again, I've slightly run over, so I apologize for that. Um, but what we've done in this session, we've gone through the respiratory exam, hopefully a little bit quicker than last week. 
we have gone through what we're looking for in the exam and how that applies to a person that you might actually see in front of you. We've talked about some of the conditions that you might expect to see in your exam, um, which is going to be something that is it's typically going to be a chronic stable patient. So things in the respiratory exam could be COPDs, pneumonectomies, pulmonary fibrosis, um, could be asthma, although you may not, if somebody's well controlled, you may not expect to find any symptoms with that. So think about things where you're going to be able to pick up a couple of signs. They're going to be well enough to, to book in, to come in, and those will lead you to a few different conditions that you could prepare for by thinking about the signs and symptoms that you might might elicit. Um, we've talked through a number of multiple choice questions, talked about a little bit of exam technique and how you can rule stuff in and out. And we've used that to illustrate some key topics in respiratory medicine. So that's all for this week, guys. Uh, next week, I, I can't remember what the topic is, but I think it's going to be Rob that's leading it for you next week. So what I will do, if you don't mind, is pop in the chat um, a link to the feedback form. I'll leave the window open. We'll stop recording here. So for anybody that's watching it later, that's it. But if um, you guys don't mind just having a look in the chat, 